Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to our first episode of MJR and Friends Season 3. We haven't been here in a minute, like six months, and if you transfer that into minutes, that's like six minutes. So we haven't been here in about six minutes. It's been a while, but we're excited to be back. MJR and Friends be streaming on Spotify, uh, Apple, Google, and YouTube. This is where this video is going to be playing today. We're here with former professional minor league baseball umpire and owner and a signer of the Rhode Island American Le uh, Legion umpires. We have Scott Malloy. Scott, how are you doing, man? Mike, how are you, brother? Thank you for having me on. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on. I'm excited to do this. I made a post last week, and Scott's like, do you want to talk baseball and umpires? I'm like, no. And he's like, all right, well, I want to come on anyway. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so, just, okay, Ken. Well, um, very excited to talk about it. Obviously, I'm a big fan of baseball, and um, that's what MJ and our friends is all about. So we're coming back. we got a lot of interviews planned um, for this season. And if you want to come on, feel free to message us, talk about your charity, talk about your business, if you're a musician, all that stuff. If you ump, if you do anything, you know, feel free. We're going to come on. We're going to have fun. And we're also debuting, uh, just debuted our other podcast, my buddy John, Opinions Not Facts, talking about sports, where we give opinions, no facts whatsoever. We could tell you that Tom Brady played for the Cowboys, and you believe us because it's an opinion. So anyway, let's get into it. Scott's here today to talk about his journey and what he does uh, uh, for a living. And we're just going to start it with the basic question, who is Scott? Who is Scott Malloy? What's your story? Where do you come from? He comes from the famous Malloy family. Shout out Jim Malloy, CLCF. We play every Monday night. He hooks it up. Love it. Um, who is Scott? So, I mean, I'm the small guy from the small state, man. You know, uh, I believe back in the day, I participated in a uh, Fair Factor program that uh, Disney World ran, which I don't even know if they still do it. A little local show, nothing crazy. But they said, you know, give, give us a description of you. And I said, oh, I'm, the, I'm the, the smallest guy with the biggest heart. And, you know, the whole place went ballistic. And then I look back now, I'm like, oh, that's so corny. But, hey, you know what? <laughs> you did Fair Factor? I did. So MG, uh, used to be MGM Stewart, whatever it was back in Disney. They uh, they do like a local show where it's, they just do three. You have to try out to get on the show. And then it's just a small little hour long thing. But you do three events and they're all physical stunts. And uh, it was pretty cool. It was recorded and stuff. We had about 800 people in the stand. So it was cool. And I was able to win that. Um, no way I could do that today. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, like eating bugs and stuff, right? No, they did that in between us getting ready and stuff for the different uh for the different physical ones, the fan, the uh, audience had to do that. So it's was, it was actually pretty funny. Uh, was Joe Rogan there? Joe Rogan was not there, and Joe Rogan probably doesn't even know that exists. <laughs> <laughs> you would have known about you though, because you're a little man with a big heart. heart <laughs> like, hashtag heart over height. Um, <laughs> I like that, right? Well, that that you know Nate Robinson. I do not know Nate Robinson play, personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He used to play in the NBA, and I remember he used to post that because he could, like, dunk over, like, Yao Ming. He was nasty. Like, hashtag was hard over height, so. Yep. Mm -hmm. I like that. I can't say that because I'm tall. But <laughs> I guess I could still, when I look at a 6'5 person, I can say that. Um, let's let's talk about how you got into umping and baseball. Did you play baseball when you were younger? I'm assuming. I did. So I played till I was 18. Um, never played for school or anything like that. I wasn't. I couldn't hit the ball well enough to do that. Um, but I went until I was 18. I actually started umpire when I was 12. Um, and I realized that I was much better at that. So I started pursuing that to go into higher levels. And then, uh, uh I got offered once to go, uh, come go to pro school. And I'm like, hey, you know, why not I'll give it a whirl? I mean, and, and, you know, I had a lot of people involved that said, you know, I'm pretty good. I think you'd be all right. You might be able to have fun, you know, new experiences, maybe help you uh, climb the college ranks if you don't get into that. And, uh, I went, uh, I went to school. School is five weeks long in the month of January. It was down at uh, Vero Beach. It was the, uh, back then it was called the Umpire School. It's now called the Minor League of Professional Academy for Umpires. Uh, five weeks of that, uh, we would work about eight hours a day inside and outside in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, so it was pretty similar to a military style run. Um, we did drills, we did formations similar to they would there. Um, and then after that, they you either get invited to a week long what they call eval course, or you get sent either into the minor. Like this is going back now because it's, it's actually changed recently. Um, you either get put into the college ranks, or you go into their system where they can watch you, or you get elected to go into minor league baseball. Um, I was told to go into their league that they watch under. I just missed the opportunity to get into minor league baseball. I was part of my problem was I was a little overweight at the time. Um, so I came back a year later that went back to the same eval course, the one week course, and I was uh, invited into professional baseball. 
And uh, I spent three in, I spent in total three years there. Um, it's a good time. You know, I gained a lot of experiences before um, I walked away from it myself. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why I did, but I just didn't, I didn't see myself succeeding all the way to where I wanted to get to. So I figured it wasn't worth the time to put into the commitment and have to make my life a little harder on the back half, trying to move on at 40 years old as opposed to 29. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. What what makes what makes umpiring so hard? Like what what what's the big? Is it the fans? Is it the play? Like is it the pace? What what is it? What is it that makes it so hard? So baseball, and then and you know you'll get a lot of different opinions of this, but in my opinion, baseball is one of the hardest sports to officiate because there are so many different rules, and you only have a split second aside from professional baseball at the top levels where there's replay uh, at every other amateur level and below, and even some college levels and high school levels, there's no replay. So you have to do everything on the fly. You get one shot to see it. You don't get five different angles. You don't get in slow motion. You don't get to watch as many times you want. You get it full speed, one shot. So that can be very difficult in itself. On top of that, and most, the most baseball you'll see that most people will do in their careers is only two men. uh, they call it a two-man crew. So essentially there's only two umpires on the field. So that base guy has to see all three bases by himself. There is assistance from the plate umpire in certain situations, but there's, it's impossible to get a perfect angle when you're all by yourself out there trying to cover three bases, especially when it comes to multiple runners. So that definitely puts you at a disadvantage as well because you can't get to the best angle possible because it's just not possible to do with two people. Um, even when you add more guys to the field as you climb up the ranks, you go to three-man, four-man, it's the same issues because it's just not possible to be everywhere. It makes it easier the more guys that are on the field, but that's one of the big problems with, with umpiring. And then you got to factor in the baseball is some of the funkiest rules of all sports. And, you know, they say every day that, you know, something will happen on TV and, and, and on the big, in the big leagues and you're watching the game at home and, and all of a sudden you just see umpires point and they're putting up fists, they're calling guys safe and nobody has any idea what's going on. And, and that's, that's another problem that, you know, that they're trying to get us to implement using a microphone system similar to football where the official will come out and say, you know, hey, there's holding, whatever. Now we can say, hey, you know, there's interference on the shortstop, so we're putting the runner on second base, and we're going to put the batter at first base, kind of be able to break it down. And then, of course, you know, the other big thing, and one of the reasons which I, I hope we get to talk to a little bit, is we're having a shortage, and the reason for the shortage is because these poor guys are getting ridiculed. They, you know, they're, they're coming off the field, and they got parents, they got, they got coaches, they got players. They're ridiculed. Like, some of these personal attacks these people make on you – over a game, especially at the amateur level where these kids are supposed to just be learning and developing. Who cares who wins or loses? That's that's where you get them into high school and get them into college and then try to get them into Pro Bowl. That's when that matters. Youth baseball shouldn't matter. The whole point of youth baseball is for development. And some of these people at the younger levels, I'm talking seven, eight years old, these parents are chasing umpires to the parking lot after games. They're spitting on their cars. They're urinating in their cars. I mean, they're breaking they're, – they're causing physical damage to people's property over a baseball game. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I myself, since I've come home, I've, I've now been out of professional baseball. This, is, this coming summer will be three years out. I've already been – I've had two different parents in two different years follow me to the parking lot after a game. It's me, and they know who I am. They don't care. People are relentless. And you, you, there's just the, the money that's another big thing, too, with amateur baseball specifically, and even some of the lower levels below pro ball, the umpires aren't getting paid fairly. I mean, some of these guys, they're working three-hour, four-hour games, and they're making 40 bucks. I mean, that's not worth it. That, that, that time is, is absurd. So there's, there's, there's no money in it in some levels, in some situations, and there's all that hassle involved. It doesn't make any sense for somebody to do it. And we're just – we're running out of people because they're literally – they're chasing people out of the game. I have some kids – I'll bring in an 18-year-old kid that's that's just going to be going into college. And, you know, he, he played his whole career. And, you know, maybe he played a high school career and he's not good enough or doesn't – or chose not to go into college baseball. So he's like, oh, I want to give umpire a try. He does one game. He gets screamed at walking off the field. He he's quits. Gone. He's gone. I lost them. And there's this, I can't, unfortunately, I can't be at every single game at every single level to protect these kids or protect these newer umpires. And that's, that's the problem because they, they, they quit. I, I, I can't blame them. I look back now, if, if I was 12 years old and it, times were way different back then, you know, it, it, I'm 30 now, you know, going, we're going back over 10 years. I mean, if, if I was chased off the field, my first game, which fortunately, you know, I, I always had my father with me at the games and he, he had to, even back then he had to step in a couple of times with some crazy people. But if I had that every game, I would have quit too. And I totally get it. 
So, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons that this whole country, this is not just local to the Northeast or the Midwest or anything like that. The entire country is having a shortage of officials and we got to fix it. And this this is one way we're going to, people just got to leave these guys alone and these women alone. That You know, they're working, they're, they're kids t-ball game. Who cares if your t-ball player wins? If they're not good, they're not going to play past 10 anyway. So, <laughs> develop. It's true. It, it, you, you bring up like it, you made me bring up like three point like couple points in my head. The first one: Do you watch Impractical Jokers? I do. The best there's one where the punishment is Q has to sit in the in the uh, in the stands and like yell at his daughter. So I and have. It just, it just makes me think of that because that's what happens. I used to see it at basketball games. Yep. And one thing that like I, I that came to my head, two things came to my head is number one, I feel like even at eight years old. There are parents that are like these kids need scholarships. Like they're chasing, they're chasing that scholarship. Everything's got to be serious. And number two, um, I even remember listening to the radio a few years back, and he, maybe not as young as eight years old, but you got kids as young as thirteen years old getting Tommy John surgery, getting these things because they. You see a lot of pitchers become better after that surgery, and they they come out stronger. And these kids are getting the surgery because the parents are like, yeah, we want that scholarship money. We want to get that. And I feel like that's part of the reason why they take it so seriously, which is it's insane. Mm -hmm. It's it's insane. So yeah, those are kind of some of the points I sure. And you're you're 100 right. And you know, and I'm I'm not saying I disagree because I totally agree. That's and that's how these people think. But you know, one thing that some people don't really understand, or or just maybe are even delusional about is that their eight-year-old is not getting looked at by professional scouts, no matter how good they are. I mean, I watched a TikTok video the other day. There's some eight-year-old kid somewhere. They showed this kid making four plays. This kid was unbelievable. I'll give it to you. He was. I've never seen a kid that age be able to make plays like that. Even that kid's not getting looked at by professional players. Yeah, that might come across their desk as a joke. Hey, look at this kid. We'll, we'll look at him in 20 years. All right, great. In 20 years, we're going to look at him. He could might not even make it that far. Who knows what could happen? So that, that's what people, I don't think, understand. There's no scouts at your eight-year-old kid's game. It's just the way it is. There's no high school scouts. There's no nobody. Give What's them the youngest you see them Say it again? What's the youngest age you see them at? Scouts? Yeah. I've seen high school scout uh, coaches go and scout kids in their freshman year of middle school, so sixth grade. That's the lowest I've ever – I've never seen a high school player or a high school coach or scout go to a 12-year-old game, which pe I know there's people that disagree with this, especially if they're involved in travel ball. Yeah. There's never been a scout that's gone there and actively said, okay, I'm going to make sure in four years I get this kid. They just don't do that. Unless you have a school like Bishop Hendrick, in which there is – I shouldn't say never because there's definitely – the word never does shouldn't exist. Hendrick in baseball, for instance, does recruit at a younger age. Now, I'm not saying that guy's going to those, every single one of those 12-year-old games going, up. Oh, he's going to be my stud in five years. But they're at least putting them on the radar. But even then, that changes every day too. Mm -hmm. It's insane. It is. It is insane. I, I saw it. I saw it even when I was teaching martial arts, just how competitive. Eight years old, nine years old. Yep. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. It is insane. Let's talk about – the biggest what would you say the biggest difference or differences are between the professional game minor league and into college oh uh, so this is this is actually there's a lot and i mean to just to start off the the big one is the rule sets so college baseball and uh professional baseball or official baseball rules as they call it they use that rule book and then college baseball uses the ncaa rule book and, you know, there's there's a lot of key rule differences. And, you know, college will turn around and say, well, we, we have these differences for safety and pr protecting the players. And in some situations, that's completely true. But then there's other situations where you look at this rule and it's just different to be different. Because a lot of the times they, they unfortunately, and, and, you know, this is, this you can say this is an opinion, but there's more evidence to show it's not. It's more about just making a quick buck because these, every time you create a new rule set, you need a new rule book. And that's money towards that, that program. Even high school baseball, high school baseball uses uh, national federation rules. Those rules are even different than the other two. So it, it's, that's, you know, and that's, you asked earlier, what, what's another reason that we're losing umpires. When you have these guys trying to go through the ranks and, and climb different levels of baseball, that's three different rule sets alone that they have to worry about. And we confuse rules all the time. It's, it's part of the game. We're playing the same exact game with different rules for, for the same exact play. And it, it all depends on where you're at and what the day is, what rule set they're playing on. Is there a way to bring that they'll ever bring that together? No, there's too much money involved. It's, it's like that's like asking if they're ever going to go back to all wood bats. They just can't. There's, there's too much money what involved. What is up with that? So they get a, you know, so they, 
I think when aluminum bats were created, they were created back in the day to add to for younger kids because you know they say wood bat hitters are true hitters because there's you don't get any cheap pop off the bat or anything like that. It's wood. So everything that everything that happens where wherever a ball goes or, or a power behind the hit, that's the hitter. So you know, younger kids, you, you give a twelve year old kid a, a wooden bat, you're not going to see a lot of big action plays because they're barely going to get the ball out of the infield. It's just the way it is. And in some of these situations, the bats aren't even made for kids that age. So I think that was the initial creation of was to give more power to the ball and make hits go a little further. And then what happened was the bats were, were, were becoming dangerous because they were making the ball come off so hard. So then they even reduced the power behind the, the, the metal bats and aluminum bats. And that kind of made people say, well, what do we even get away from the wood for then if we're doing that? But now there's just there's so much money involved in those aluminum bat companies and those metal bats that they'll, you'll never be able to go back and just eliminate them. It's just too much money involved. And they got too much control over the game of baseball at this point. Do you see a – because um, a lot of the big talk, especially with the MLB, is just how how much has just gone down in terms of viewership and – I mean, I, I I consider myself to be a Red Sox fan. I used to be a bigger Red Sox fan. Um, I mean, I was very into them earlier this year. I can't. I just can't get into a team that is constantly either losing or just average when it comes to baseball. It's not like football. You can sit and watch a three-hour Patriot game once a week. But, like, when it's Red Sox every single night and they stink or whatever, do you find that the viewership, especially with the MLB, do you find more kids coming out still to play baseball the same, or do you actually see a, a decrease in kids? You see it in umpiring, but the kids in baseball, do you see less people coming out and playing, or is it still the same? So it's it's funny because that question, depending on who you ask that question to, you're going to get three different answers. And, you know, one of the main reasons that baseball is down in viewership, which it is, it's not it's not like it used to be, but it's not down to where baseball's disappearing either, like people say, where it's going to vanish in five years. That's Baseball is never going to go away because the numbers are not as low as people think they are, especially at the professional level. And in terms of kids coming into the game, there's always going to be kids coming in. The youth levels are still pretty consistent at where they were at. It's just the issue you have now is, is you know, Ba the, the world has changed compared to when baseball was created. You know, it, we always call it America's pastime, where these games were going three and a half, four hours, sometimes more if you go extra innings. Mm -hmm. And, and the, today's youth and today's society in general is a fast-paced, different world than it was back then. You know, before social media and before technology, we all lived at a smooth, slow pace. Well, everybody's fast-paced. Everybody wants everything done quick. Everything wants to get done. You can't even hold kids' attention for longer than an hour at this point. So that's one of the reasons they say at the younger levels they're struggling because kids don't have the patience to stand out there for two hours anymore to do a baseball game. So one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons that you're seeing so many changes in rules and pace of play and all that is because baseball is trying to stay with the times and we're trying to make the game shorter so that games are going on average two hours, two and a half hours, maybe three is a long game with, without extra innings. But the problem with that is, is that takes away revenue from the professional level because when you want – you know, these ballparks, they want games to go longer. People are buying hot dogs. They're buying food. They're buying alcohol. So when you have a four-hour game, that's more money and more revenue that they're bringing in on top of the gate fee alone, especially if there's a rain delay or if the game's go extra innings. That's more money that, you know, these general managers, a game goes extra innings, they're licking their chops because they know they're going to make more money than they should have made yeah. the other day because yeah. people are going to go buy food. They're going to go buy water. Oh, we're going to stick around. We're in inning 13. Let's go get a drink. Let's go get another hot dog. It's our third hot dog of the day because we've been here for four and a half hours. So at that level, they, they still want the games to go long. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword because – but the longer the games go, the less viewership they get at the younger kids and, and you know, the, the non – I call them baseball purists – that they don't want to stick around and watch four hours anymore. They want a game done in an hour and a half, exactly. especially yeah. at the youth level. They, they, these kids, they want a game – they want to be going out – like you said, you know, a football game is two hours. All right, so I went to my nephew's eight-year-old football game last weekend. The game is one hour long. And even in that hour, you could see those kids were slowly starting to fade away. Like they were mm -hmm. that's football. So, you know, that, that definitely plays a role in it. And it's just the change of society is going against what baseball is because baseball was never made to be a quick game. It's nine innings of baseball plus an additional amount of unlimited innings if you have a tie game. So you don't have a clock to work with. Or you don't have a, a, a – at the professional level, you don't have a run limit if a team is blowing out the other team, whereas you do in most nope. amateur baseball. Nope. And I think that's part of why, you know, even what you were saying, you know, the Red Sox were interested at the beginning and they're, they're not now. That's because they play too many games. And, again, it's a revenue thing at the pro level. It's, it, it'd be very tough to, to shrink oh, yeah. down that, that season. You know, we're talking over 100 games, whereas 
even a basketball season doesn't or the football season is 16 games and, and you play once a week. That's why they have the biggest viewership in all sports. You only get to watch them once a week, sometimes mm-hmm. twice if they're playing a Thursday, Monday or, or a Thursday, Sunday, vice versa, you know. It's like it's like attraction, you know. You want you, you don't don't be over that girl all over. You know what I'm <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, and and the GMs are, ch- uh, are are looking at chops too because they charge ten dollars for a hot dog at Fenway Park. You can't even go to Fenway Park for less than three hundred dollars. It's fifteen dollars for a beer there. One of the tall boys. Oh, it's so gross. And you know a college kid's gonna go there and grab ten of them. So yep. look how much money they just made off that kid. Oh, yep, it's insane. It's insane. Um, something I, I want to talk about is. You could go into detail. You, know, you put down, you know, ending the divide between the high school board umpires and the American Legion baseball umpires. Can you explain more about that? Sure. So, you know, and there's a little bit of history here, and I'll, I'll try not to bore you. I'll try to keep it as short as I can because we could we could have a podcast strictly on this for two hours. Yeah. So going back to even before I was involved in, in the signing or anything like that, I was I was still very young. Uh, the, the local high school baseball board, pretty much ran everything in the state. They had American Legion under their belt. They had the high school board. They had a couple men's leagues that at the time were considered like starter leagues for these guys to go into college baseball, et cetera. And what happened was there was a divide that happened between some of the members that split up the board between American Legion baseball and high school baseball. And, you know, you'll get different, different opinions from different people on each side of that fence. But essentially, you know, it, it all bet, and I hate to say this, but unfortunately, it's true. Um, baseball umpires are cutthroat people, and they, you know, there's a lot of people that, that they just want control. They want control of everything, even if they're not working the games. They still want control of it. That's just the way it is. So, you know, there was it was a battle of control. That, you know, some guys didn't agree with what the the board at the time was doing and some of the decisions they were making. So they essentially split off and they took whoever were interested in working American Legion baseball in the summer. And then they went and created their own association. But what it created was anyone that went and worked in that association was essentially not given playoff games at the high school level. And they weren't doing any postseason games. They were just used during the regular season. And even then they weren't guaranteed any number of games. And then the guys that decided to stay and dedicate to the high school board couldn't work American Legion baseball, but they at least would get postseason games. So then they would have no good baseball to go do in the summertime at that time. That was before AAU and all that when there was much more better baseball to do during the summer. So, you know, that that was a process that that happened for over 10 years where there was they essentially put a fence up and they said, you have to pick a side of the fence and that's where you're going to play. So I essentially was put I, when I got into it, I had one side with, with and I was out. I didn't have all of this information at the time. So I essentially unintentionally picked a side and I started working in American Legion baseball when I was I believe I was 16 years old at the time. Um and I was put in, you know, I, I was put into a, a big situation and, you know, I, I did well and they, they were very happy with me and they brought me in to get to, to do more games there. And that, of course, aggravated the other side, which I, I didn't understand at the time. And I, I get now much more and I get why it happened. But essentially, um, going back three years ago, uh, yeah, three years ago, to so 2019, um, I was approached by the American Legion board and they they offered me the position of the umpire in chief for the board to re- and be the head of the umpires for the league. So. I understood that there was good guys on that other side of the fence that worked high school baseball that belonged to an American Legion baseball. So I essentially kicked that fence down and said, this is not happening anymore. There's no more divide between this and that. If you work American Legion baseball, you shouldn't be penalized from the high school side. And essentially what I said was, if you work for me, I'm not going to, if you work for those guys, I'm not going to penalize you and not give you American Legion games. I will gladly give anyone that wants to work American Legion baseball that's qualified to do it, to come and do it. And, you know, I, I bring more of a, you know, I was taught a professional level and granted, this is not professional baseball, but I bring what I've learned at that level. And from the administrative point down to this level, and I, I expect the best of the best because that's, I give everything that I can to this. So I expect that in return from my guys that were and girls that work for me. And it's, it, you know, it's, this is going to be uh, year four coming up. I just signed a new three-year contract with American Legion baseball. And, you know, they were very happy, especially last year. We had we had a very brutal season last year. You know, it was it was condensed because of COVID. We had actually lost Legion baseball the year before, but we created an, an alternate league that essentially was Legion without the title. But it, it's been a very difficult two years out of my first three years involved doing it. And even so, you know, another thing, that a setback that I had, and it's not necessarily a setback, but it, it kind of held back 
who I could use. I had to use the current association at the time to finish off the contract when I first took it over, which wasn't a bad thing. There was some very good guys in that organization that now still currently work for me, but it also limited that I still couldn't use those high school guys. So they were still not getting the best uh, workers on the field that they deserved. So that's why once I was the rain, essentially the handcuffs were taken off and I could bring in whoever I wanted to the group. That's what I did. And, you know, last year we, we had one of the best years that we've ever had on, on top of having a condensed season, which the entire Legion season, which is normally two and a half months, was condensed down to one month. They, some of these teams were playing double headers every single day, every day of the week. And we also had um, it was condensed and it had to be done at a certain time. And it, we were just able to make it work, and it, it went well. We had a, we had a great finals. We had no issues. I mean, it's every game was covered. But on top of it, we had weather issues. This was one of the worst summers in history in terms of rain and cancellations. And the, I give these coaches in this league a lot of credit because they make their own schedules, and they're required to 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 uh, get these games uh, covered and and uh, made up if they get rained out. And these guys work their rear ends off to even get games in, especially when you have kids that are burnt out because they had just finished the football season before they came on less than a month before the season started because that was condensed. So it, it, there was a lot of negatives that went against us this year, but we still had one of our best years ever. So it was it's a really good thing. Well, let's flow into this question now. How do you maintain a professionally run umpire association? So I hold people accountable. And so one of the big things I do is, is, is I hold people accountable for what they do and their actions on the field. Another thing is, is, is I strive for what I call the administrative part of the job. So it's not just what you do on the field or, or you know, what happens in your games. It's what you're doing off the field. Are you – communicating with me when you have issues on the field with a coach, with a player, if something happens on the field, are you calling me after the game like you're supposed to do, like I asked them to do? Are they filling out reports that they have to do if they have an ejection or something like that? Are they following the pr the protocol before they do eject somebody? Or are they just running out there and heaving everybody? Or you, have, you have to do a report for an ejection? Yes. So if they have an ejection, they're required to call me immediately after the game is over wow. with their partner in the parking lot because I need to know what happened because – the first call I get, if it's not from the umpires, is going to be from the person that's ejected. That's guaranteed that happens every time. And they're going to call me. They're going to tell me what happened. They're going to go ballistic, and they're going to want to know why it happened on the field. And if I get that call first before I communicate with my umpires, I'm screwed. And I all I can sit there is just say, I don't know what to tell you because I haven't been told anything. I need to look up this information for you. And it's the it, it makes me feel this big when that's the answer I have to give somebody that, oh, i got to get back to you because I don't know what happened. I haven't heard from my umpires. And that's something that is that is that screams amateur baseball that, you know, a, a crazy situation will happen on the field. The assigner gets no wind of it. And then the assigner is getting chased down by the league or the person involved and they don't have an answer. And, and that's what where they sit there and go, well, these guys can't even be accountable for what happens on the field. And that's that's another thing. I hold guys accountable for what happens. So if they follow the procedures and the protocol that I put into place. It's going to work out and it, it's a professional level. You know, there's there's certain things somebody has to do that's an automatic ejection. Then if they don't go and for, the, we call it the 10 standard uh, standards for removal of the game. And if it's something that's outside of those 10 standards, then they're required to be warned before they're ejected. And it's it, it sounds like such a simple thing. But there's guys that just they, they, they get stuck in the moment or which is even worse and it is very common in amateur baseball is they try to ignore everything. And they'll have a guy screaming at them for nine or for seven innings. Every single pitch, every single situation happens, they got somebody screaming, and they're just sitting there and ignoring it because they think it's going to go away. That doesn't work in baseball. You, it, It's not like football or basketball where you can have, you'll see these guys on the sideline bapping mm -hmm. in their ear, and the official just stands there and takes it, and then he runs away. You have the advantage of being able to go to the other side of the field. In baseball, they're going to still scream at you from the dugout. It doesn't matter where you go on the field. You're still going to listen to it. And that's where baseball is a lot different than football and, and basketball, for instance. And even hockey, because you're stuck at the you, – you can't scare, you can't yell at the guy that's across the ice. He can't hear you anyway. But that's something that some guys don't understand, and they think, well, if I just ignore them, they're going to leave me alone. And that's not the case. I mean, they, if you ignore something that's being screamed at you, it's only going to get worse because they're going to, A, think that they can keep doing it, so they're going to keep doing it. Or they think it's going to give them the advantage because you're going to give them calls so that they leave you alone. And that's not good either no. because that creates all kinds of issues in itself. What's the craziest ejection you ever had? Oh, no, what happened? Oh, it looks like we lost him. Oh, there he is. I'm back. You're back. All right. I, I wanted to ask you, what was the craziest ejection you ever had, if you can even talk about it? 
Oh, I can talk about it. I don't Let's care. Go. So, the, so I, I've had, there's a few of them that are, are good stories, I'll, but I'll tell you my personal favorite. And it's my favorite because I, the reason I say it's my favorite, it, it's really not a good one, but it, it was a good learning lesson for me and for something that I can share to other umpires. And essentially, again, it goes back to accountability. You need to be credible in knowing who you are ejecting from the game. So we're going to go back to when I was in Pro Bowl. I was working in the South Atlantic League or the South, and I was in uh, Asheville. And uh, I was working that, a plate. Is that single A? Or that, that yes, that's, that's a ball. Yep. Single A ball. It's actually in uh, Bull Durham. The, the ballpark in Asheville was used in Bull Durham, and it still looks exactly like that. It's a very retro ballpark. And uh, that played into the situation because the way the field is designed, the dugouts are essentially in the stands. There's a net directly behind it. And the people in the front row of the stands are literally standing directly behind the players that could be standing or sitting right against the netting, which a lot of them will sit on the back of the rail of the dugout. So there, there are people inches away from these players. So, you know, I, I was working the plate and um, I was getting a lot of uh, chirping and complaining or yelling as we call it. We call chirping people yelling from the dugout and stuff. They, they were unhappy with the strike zone that they were getting. So, you know, I addressed the dugout and I said, listen, you, you guys got to stop. I'm not going to, I listened to it for three innings. I'm not going to keep listening to it. And I actually, I stepped out, I took my mask off and, and I said, that. I said, you guys need to stop. This is enough. I, I've been listening to it for three innings. We need to move on. I'm not going to listen to you. Keep yelling at me about every pitch that you don't like. I turn around. The moment I turn around and go to put my mask on, I hear from the dugout, shut up, you suck. So I had a general area of where that was because I knew the area that it was from. So I turned and looked, and there was only one guy sitting in that area. So I'm, I, I used the process of elimination. Said, "That's my man. See you later." I got him. So come to find out, the man. Of course, now this it stops the game. I, I stopped the game. The manager comes out and says, "Who'd you run?" And I said, and I pointed at the kid. I, I, I said, I, put, "I ran him right there." I, I don't know. I can't see their numbers and stuff like that. So you got to get an appearance, and then you find out from the manager who he is, and then you you go from there when you have to do your report. So he comes out and he's so confused. He goes. He goes, Scott, th that's the wrong guy, man. He goes, that's the, that's the, that's the team you, the kid doesn't speak. Like the kid literally doesn't speak. He, he's, he was an introvert. Like he was a pitcher dude. Doesn't talk to him. He goes out there, he pitches, he sits down. He doesn't communicate with anybody. So even the, when the kid actually found out that it was him, they, they said it was him and he pointed at himself like that. He was so confused. He just walked away. He didn't say anything else. He didn't, when you run somebody in that situation, that player is going to keep yeah, going. Yeah. At you. Yeah. This kid just walked away. He went in the clubhouse. So, you know, the manager said, you know, that you just cost that kid in, in, in professional baseball. If they get ejected, they get fined. So he said, you just cost that kid his meal for the day. And he didn't even say anything to you. So, you know, and I talked to a couple of the players on the team that I that I knew and that I was that, that I could trust would give me their honest opinion. And one of them was the catcher. You know, the kid comes out and I said, you know, did I get the right guy? He goes, nah, man. He goes, you, you got the. He goes, you actually got the next day started. He's supposed to start for us tomorrow. And oh. he, he's the team mute. The kid never, like, he doesn't, like, if we're going to charge the fielder for a fight, he's the one that sits down and they got to tell him, get out there. So I'm like, well, I'm like, that's, that's unfortunate. So come to find out what actually happened was there was a fan standing directly behind that kid. He's the one that yelled out to me to, sh to shut up and that I sucked. So when I threw, the, the, when I made the motion and said, you're gone, he sat down. And the other kid was still standing, but he never said a, the kid never said a word. Oh. So come to find out, security actually kicked the fan out of the game because he, he oh, cost. They, they said, you know, you cost our guy, you you cost our guy a fine, and he's the next day starter for tomorrow. So you just screwed us. So wow. it was it, it was a, it was a good learning experience. And when I, you know, just to, to finish it up, you know, because people are gonna say, oh, so this, you, you cost this kid money. I, I didn't. What happened was I called the league president after the game. I explained the situation to what happened. I admitted, which I'm not afraid to do, that I was wrong and that I ejected a player for what a fan said. The manager, the league president completely understood it was one of the big, you know, uh, Cooper was his last name. Um, probably one of the best league managers in professional baseball when we still had league presidents. The guy was he understood both sides of the game and he he understood what the umpire was there for. He was your foot soldier and he was your eyes and ears for the league. And he was by far one of the best league presidents in baseball. But he said to me, he goes, he goes, you know, man, he goes, that happens. He said, you know, all I ask is just before you run somebody in the future, make sure that you're 100 percent, 110 percent sure that's the guy that made the comment. He goes, but don't worry about it. He goes, I'm going to just we'll file this report. and The kid's not going to get fined. It's no problem. So not only did the kid not get fined, he actually came out to me the next day when he came out to pitch and he thanked me because it was during the NBA playoffs. And I got him back in the clubhouse to watch the game. <laughs> so I did the kid a favor. Wow. So that's my story that I like to tell people when they ask me what's your projection story. That's a good story. That's a good story. Um, well, 
Let me ask you this. Um, we talked about the lack of umpires before. What is some of your ideas and also as well future ideas and clinics that you want to do to, to grow the umpire association, to grow the amount of numbers of umpires um, and to bring it back to what it was? So, you know, that, that's another thing that, that I have. Rejection. Say I want to say the last part, Mike. Sorry. Teaching of proper ejection. <laughs> so you know that's that's another thing that I have as an advantage of spending time in professional baseball and, and working at Division One college level of baseball is I, I'm one of the only guys still in the state that that run aside from when they bring you know the high school board still runs um, clinics when they bring in new guys but after their first two years of going to the and most of it is is in classroom work. Once they're done and on the board, there's really no other training at, at this point. We're working on change. I'm also involved with that board now as well. And we're trying to implement more training for these guys, even the guys that have been on the board for 20 plus years. But so I'm one of the only guys currently that still does professional style clinics. And it, you know, it, it that that in itself, I think, helped benefiting me to get the position of the um, the the owner of the or the head of signer for American Legion because I was still doing trainings and I was giving these guys professional training. Now, granted, it's not it, it's a one or two day clinic on a weekend for three hours or or, or less because I can't keep these guys for for seven straight days working them eight hours a day. It's just not possible in, in this situation, and it's it's just it's not logical either. But so that that's one of the big things that that I have going my way is, is I can do these trainings and I can I bring in other professional guys or other college division one umpires to assist me in training. And that's just something that, that these other local groups don't have the luxury of having. And they just, you know, like even some of these guys that are other assigners, yeah, they're assigned in baseball and they, they have an association, but they, they, they don't have professional training under their belt. And it's not their fault. They just never had that opportunity. So they, they, they're they not going to be able to give the same quality of training that I can give. And it's nothing against them. It's just, it's just the way it is. So that that's a big drawing point for me, too, because I can offer this training. And I have guys coming in that don't even work for me that want to get involved. So it, it works out great. And then all of a sudden, I had a guy that came that just wanted to better his own career for his Little League games. But, hey, he's pretty good. Why, you know, why don't you come work for me? Let's let's advance you in your career. You know, we'll get you into high school baseball. And then, hey, maybe if you want to pursue a college career, we can get you into that, too. And, and that's that's another draw that we have is we can push these guys into college baseball and, and continue to, to raise their careers to the next level, which is what a lot of guys want to do. They just don't know how to do it or they can't they don't know where to go to get the training to be able to do it. So I, I feel that I have that luxury to be able to do that. And, you know, I, I run I always try to run at least one big camp a year. And, and you know, when, when I first uh, brought this association together, I, I ran a huge clinic. Um, this is going back before, uh, pre-COVID. And, you know, I had to max out the clinic. I had a waiting list. You know, it was it was a great draw. We, I ended up having I, I believe I had about um, I think it was about 72 guys that I had in total wow. that made it to that clinic. It was great. All ages? Yeah, I had all ages. I had anyone from 18 up to 70 years old. Then I it didn't matter. Men, women didn't matter. It was it was wow. great. So, you know, and most of the guys that went to that clinic are currently working for me. They, they may not be working the highest level of Legion, but I also have junior Legion, So they're working that. And that's that's usually uh, late middle school, early high school kids. So that's where that's a developed level for my guys that I can use to help them train and evaluate them on that and then help them move up to the senior level and potentially move on to college. So, you know, that's my goal is to every year at least put on one of those big clinics and then allow that to either give me more guys into my group or at least allow guys to better themselves in their own groups, which is good. And that's what I want. I don't want anyone to feel like they have to come on and only work American Legion baseball. They can work any baseball they want for me. My season is only two months of the year. So when I'm I, essentially I, I appear, I assign my two months and then I disappear again. And for a lot of people, that's not enough baseball. They want to work the entire summer. So you need to work with other guys. I personally don't have an interest in picking up any other leagues. And I have I have leagues calling me every other day. So I'm not even kidding. Saying, you know, we want you to come assign this league. We see what you're doing with Legion. We want you to come And, you know, I, I thank them. You know, I'm so grateful for it's them. To give them. What's that? It's a lot. It is. It, it is to me. It's, I, I make the mistake of doing a lot by myself and it's it's too much for me to do. The other thing is, is I just don't have an interest in, in trying to recreate. We, we had somebody come back years ago that, that did something similar to what I'm doing now. And it ended up backfiring. You know, there, there was a lot of different reasons and it, it just didn't work out. And I don't I don't want to see that happen again. That's why I don't want to create this super group, as we call it, of the, all the best umpires are going to take over the state of Rhode Island. I'm not trying to do that. I still want the high school guys to do their high school baseball. I still want the local guys to do their levels of baseball. I just wanted American Legion baseball, and I didn't even have to pursue it. It came to me. 
So it, it's something that worked out great. And that's the other thing. And I, I tell people this and, and people don't believe me. I have never, everything that I have now, I didn't pursue. I was offered to do. I was offered to take the position of the umpire in chief for American Legion. I was offered to run this association and create this association, which I did myself just because it made it easier. I There is no league that I'm going to go out and try to take from anybody. I don't want to be that cutthroat umpire. I'm that guy that wants to get everybody involved and make everybody better and put more money in their pockets. That's awesome. I, I love it. And it you really care about what you do. And I'm sure there's people in the industry that do as well. And I'm sure there's people that do it and might not put in half as much as someone like you do. And I mean, that happens everywhere. And um, I, it just seems like you got a good plan going forward. Um, it's your life and you love it. I do. I absolutely, you know, and, and I mean, you, you got to see it. I mean, I, we go into work together and, and you'll hear me complain about, Oh, I had to deal with this crap, but this is over, especially this past summer. How, how tough it was. in the morning. I'm like, dude, shut up. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, you should be sleeping. <laughs> yeah, like, everyone's sleeping and I'm sitting there trying to fill games. Like, and, yeah. and it's just, or I'm dealing with situations that happened the night before. And it, I'm it's over there tough. on third shift seeing ghosts. Yeah. And I'm seeing ghosts. Like I got to deal with that too. <laughs> nope. So oh, it's man. tough, man. It's a tough gig. And, and you know, it's like, you and I appreciate what you said. I, cause I do, I, I give 110% to everything I do. I'm a perfectionist, which, you know, that's good and bad in itself. Um, I call it more of a curse than a blessing to be totally honest, because it, I stress out over some of this, you know, I get told, like, Dude, why are you so stressed about this? I'm like, cause it bothers me. I, I want this to be good. I don't want this to be half ass or excuse mm-hmm. me. I don't know if we can be swearing. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want this to be half done. You know, I want it to be the best it can be because that's what I always pursue for. And I put effort into everything and that's what I expect from my guys and girls. That's all I ask for. Of course. Of course. We're with Scott Malloy. Um, and we're just talking about the future of umpiring, um, the American Legion Umpires Association. And uh, Scott, I like to always end the podcast with a game. And we haven't played a game, and again, it's been a minute. It's been a time. minute, but we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna play our game, and that's called Name That List. It's time to play Name That. All right, Scott, you're not ready for this one. Uh, we're gonna play Name That, but first, we're gonna introduce a new format to Name That. We get a little jazz. We're gonna sue. We're gonna move. We're gonna move into this game. Name That. And this week's Name That is. Name That. Oh boy. Oh yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, listen to that smooth jazz. barely hear you over the audio. <laughs> How about now? There we go. I can hear you again. All right. Here's what's going to happen. We got two into the jazz. I'm going to show a picture of the umpire from the major leagues, and you're going to name which umpire it is. Oh, God. You are putting. I am going to get ridiculed if I don't do well in this. All right. That's okay. I, I don't know any of them. <laughs> I'm supposed to know all of them. That's the problem. <laughs> all right. We're going to find out. All right. First one. Ready? Let's remove this. And here it is, the first one. Uh, <laughs> that's my man. Um, oh, my God. So that's uh, Teddy Barrett, um, one of the greatest guys in baseball. We call him the chief. He's the man. Um, he's probably one of the coolest people you'll meet on this planet. And he's so kept to himself. He's also one of the most dangerous people. He was a professional boxer before he got into this. And he's a guy you don't want to mess with. Uh, you get a follow up. Another great guy. This is uh, Laz Diaz. Uh, I actually got to meet Laz in person. Uh, he's one of the guys, man, like, he's the guy you want to idolize also for this, this profession. He's the guy that goes out every single game at the, at the top level and has more fun than anybody that's out there. You know, and that, that when you get to that level, it's more of a job than a game. But this guy still enjoys every second that he's on that field. And it's he's a funny guy. He's, he's one of the biggest ball busters you'll ever meet. Great guy. Love Laz. All right, all right, all right. Next one. Ah, oh, my man. All right, so this is uh, <laughs> they're all your man. What, what yeah, I know. Now, I, I don't know him personally. This is um, oh my god, I'm right now. Um, oh, this, is CB Buckner. this is CB Buckner. Um, again, I don't know CB personally. I've heard a lot of great stories about the guy. 
Um, one of the only guys still left in the professional baseball that uses the scissor stance. Um, they're not allowed to really do it. They, they can't instruct it anymore at the professional level. But uh, he, he kind of was uh, grandfathered in. Great guy, World Series umpire. Good, good guy. Can you demonstrate the scissor stance? Oh, God, I don't, I don't really have a lot of space yet. There we go. It's like, you know, it's like one of the, you know, sitting like the big T as opposed to what we call the box stance. Oh, All right. I see. Never the best yeah, view. Needs. And Scott's done for the night. That was it. That was yeah, it. I'm done. Broken back. All right, next one. He's world famous. I mean, oh boy, Mr. Angel Hernandez. Uh, he is indeed world famous. Yes, he is. He's the one that gave up the no hitter, right? No, that was Jim Joyce. Jim Joyce uh, had the uh, missed call first base of the yeah. imperfect no hitter. Oh, that guy. That Depends guy. who you ask, because some people will say Galarraga is more famous because he didn't get that no hitter as opposed to getting it, and he got a yeah. car. <laughs> All right, final one. He's famous because he had a really bad missed call this past week. Ah, the legend himself, the man with the most officiated games in history, Mr. Joe West. Uh, Country Joe, as we like to call him in the game. Uh, Joe, again, another guy that I, I have not had the luxury of meeting. I wish I did. Um, I've heard so many good stories about him off the field. He's a very knowledgeable guy, and I know a lot of people are going to disagree with this, but – he is one of the best umpires in the game of baseball, even to this day. Um, he's one of the most rule knowledgeable guys. And he also, I know people, again, people are going to disagree with this. He's one of the best guys in terms of handling situations. Now he's not perfect. You know, he, he had the, the one that he really did. He had, a, he got in a lot of trouble for was with Bryce Hopper. Uh, I'm sorry, not Bryce Hopper. Um, Papelbon, Jonathan Papelbon. He, uh, when he physically removed him out of the way to go back on the field after he, he ejected Mr. Papelbon for uh, giving a certain gesture to the crowd when walking off the, uh, mound one game he uh got water thrown at him and he also had uh jonathan get back in his face um and was this where the red sox or phillies this was when he was with the uh, phillies i want to say i don't think it was with the reds it was the phillies it was after he left the red sox um and it actually caused a lot of stir between both they both were suspended they both were heavily fined um and it was a tough situation but i understand how like the when you have a man like Jonathan Palpatine screaming in your face, I don't blame him for putting two hands on his chest and pulling him aside. I don't blame him at all. Probably not good to say that either, but it is what it is. That's right. They didn't hear it. We got to name that. Scott goes five of five, man. That was pretty – that's the best score ever. That's uh, the best score you ever. don't understand how much I'm sweating right now, man, because if I didn't get <laughs> one of those right and any of the guys in the game saw that, it would have not been good for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that was, that, that's good good stuff good stuff good stuff i would um i would have popped out a uh, random one but i'm not gonna do that i thought i thought this was gonna be harder for you than than it was hey you, you did i will admit you picked uh the top five bigger name guys i i appreciate of course that I did. of course i did next time if you come on again hopefully you do i will pick some like minor league refs this is a lot of fun. Oh, <laughs> good luck with that that's interchanging i'll put some hockey umps on there too those are personal friends, though, so I actually might do all right with that too. I, I, I gotta, I, I'll go with, uh, international stars. Oh, jeez! International arms. Call that over, whatever on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that has been uh, our first edition of season three of Name That with the Smooth Jack. It's time to play Name That. Rest in uh, R.I.P. D.M.X. I actually. I actually did that because I do a really good DMX impersonation, especially karaoke. We got to hear it. on Facebook. And uh, I recorded that intro for him. And then this is actually the first time I used it since he passed. Oh, all right. That's Thank how long you. it's been. I think the last podcast I did was on the day he passed. Holy crap. It was midway through the podcast. And after we got off, the guys were like, hey, we just want to let you know, you know, DMX passed away. And I'm just like, I'm getting off. It's a sad day, man. It's not <laughs> a good day. I'm getting off. I'm good. Leave me alone, you know. But um, <laughs> Scott, before we go, anything else you'd like to uh, like to say or uh, shout out or? Um, no, you know, I, I just want to give a shout out to the American Legion Board, you know, for giving me the opportunity that they did, and uh, that I gotta say, man, those, those guys, they there's a solid core eight of us that are on that board, and and all of those guys have my back, man, and that that's all I can ask for. I mean, you know, one one big thing with me is is, is I'm a big supporter of your. You got to patrol. You you got to support your foot soldiers. And we're the eyes and ears for American Legion board. And, and my umpires are my eyes and ears since I can't be at every single game. And to make to it, it's so much easier to do this job knowing that you will have support of the board when situations arise, when you're doing the job correctly. If I'm wrong, that's that's a different story. But so far of, of the situations we had that I know I'm right on, they've backed me 100 percent. And that's that's all I can ask for. 
Um, and I got to throw, I got to throw a shout out. You know, um, we got the, you got the websites highlight on the bottom for me on the bottom of the screen. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, if anyone's interested in getting into baseball, whether it's, even if it, it doesn't have to be with American Legion, you could work high school baseball. You could use my, my trainings to just better yourself for, for little league, any, anything you want, softball, it, it is, whatever you want to do, we're a good spot to get started. Um, my phone is always on, um, Go to that website, the first one. That's that's the American Legion Umpires website. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a uh, it's a little sloppy. It's, you know, I, I don't pay for a URL. I, I I use a lot of free website stuff. Um, but it, it, you know, it's very it's 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 very straightforward. It's not a complicated website, and I, I do that on purpose. I try to make it easy for everybody to to navigate through. Um, my contact information is on there. Um, there's a, there's a sheet on there to get involved. I try to keep it updated for when my clinics are going to be and, and any type of evaluations where you can come and work so I can watch you to see where I would put you at. Um, and then the other two websites, one the next website is actually for the high school boards website. If you want to get into work at high school baseball specifically, and then the group under that is another local group that I suggest getting involved in. If you want to work anything, uh, high school or below outside of strictly uh, Federation high school baseball, because they have a lot of uh, AU and, and men's leagues and travel ball and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, just thank you all for uh, tuning in. Appreciate it, man. You have a lot of heart and passion for what you do. So try um, it. It was a pleasure. And I know there's probably way more we could talk about. Oh yeah. Uh, we could so do this. Hopefully, hopefully you can, uh, my buddy, John is very into baseball more than me. So you could probably uh, join us in our podcast at some point. Talk about the Red Sox missing the wild card because they probably will. Yeah, they probably uh, will. And I'd love to. They'll, they'll probably fire their manager again. Who knows? You know, we'll see. We'll see. I'm in favor of that, man. I'm not a fan. I, I am. I, I, I am. I don't like the GM. Yep. Yeah, I don't like any of them. I don't know. <laughs> I don't like any of them, to be honest with you. But um, anyway, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Scott. Really appreciate it. And you can check him out again down below at the uh, on the websites on the ticker. And you can check me out. Well, this is the wrong one. You can check me out, Facebook, MJ Entertainment, Instagram, and YouTube. This will be posted on YouTube and Spotify, Google. It's going to be across a bunch of platforms uh, as well. And uh, that is it. So thank you guys so much for watching. Stay tuned. MJ and our friends, season three, we're going to be coming out. We got we got some interviews next week. Yeah, show those shirt. Get zoomed in. Get zoomed in. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I don't even know what that says. Rhode Island baseball. Legion, baby. Legion. Rhode Island baseball. We are, we're going to be having a, we're going to be doing our first in-person podcast ever next week. And I'll be released with, uh, with Jocelyn Dame of Dame Dog Labradors. We've done it before, um, but we're doing it in person. She's going to be showing off her whole new breed of dogs. Um, it's going to be great. I get to meet them. We're going to show them off um, on, on the uh, podcast. We got a bunch of other podcasts coming um, as well. But anyway, guys, so long. Take care. Thank you so much for watching and um, stay tuned. We'll be back. Take care.